So, um, first thing I'd like to say is um, that it's a great pleasure to be here, like all the other speakers, uh, a great pleasure to be here addressing your conference today. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed my time very much, and I'm enjoying the conference. And I hope that the presentation that I'm going to make um, adds to the interest and enjoyment that you, you're experiencing so far. So, um, I just wanted to... Um, start with a little bit about the organisation that I work for and a little bit about me. So as you've heard, I work at the University of Derby. I work in uh, the International Centre for Guidance Studies there. Um, we're a small group, a, a very small team of about eight people who spend our time uh, researching, um, delivering continuing professional development, um, and uh, doing consultancy activities, not just in the UK, but um, across the world. Um, and it's a great privilege to work for this organisation because it allows us to understand what's happening all over the world and to draw um, good practice from everywhere and to use it in our teaching. So it's a great privilege um, to, to work in, in ISEGS. Uh, my role there is as a specialist in young people's uh, careers, education and guidance. And um, uh, one of the things I think would be interesting to tell you is that I'm actually um, a trained guidance uh, practitioner and worked in practice for many years um, as a practitioner and also as a manager managing frontline guidance services. And one of the things that continually frustrated me as a practitioner was the, the great focus in the UK education system on providing guidance to youngsters from the age of around 14 in any meaningful way. Um, in order to reduce the early school leaving uh, problem and also to help youngsters think about their next steps. Um, and it seemed to me at the time that there was a big thing missing, um, which was uh, starting much earlier, even, dare we say, in primary school. And for uh, many teachers and parents in the UK, this is very contentious. Okay? So when I've spoken to teachers and to parents about this, a typical response has been something like, for goodness sake, let them be kids. Let them be children. They don't need to be choosing. They're only babies. Let them play. Okay? So there's a great deal of resistance in many quarters to delivering uh, programs of career education, career management skills at an early age. And this has really frustrated me. Um, and I wanted to learn and find out more about what the theorists were saying um, and what practice did exist. And when I moved to the International Centre for Guidance Studies, this has given me a great opportunity to undertake research um, and to do more thinking about this issue. Um, and that's what I'm going to share with you uh, today. So, what am I going to try and do in 20 minutes? Um, I'm just going to touch very briefly on some theory. Um, we've heard that theory is important, but I just wanted to touch on an, a number of theories. I think I'm going to look at three very briefly, which underpin this work. Um, I'm going to look at two pieces of research which I've been involved in, which has helped me really get to grips with career learning in primary. Um, and I'm going to then draw some uh, renewed conclusions about why it's important and give um, an interesting example of the kind of activities that can be done. Um, before we look at theory, I think it's quite important to say that as career practitioners, we draw um, from uh, theory from many disciplines. Um, this is a great joy for me. I can be looking at theory which underpins uh, business. I can be looking at uh, theory which is around sociology or education theory. We draw from a great many theories um, uh, to give us a broad theoretical framework. And I think it's very important to remind ourselves of this because theory is one of the um, cornerstones, if you like, of being a professional, that we have a body of underlying theory which helps us think about what we do and why we do it. It gives us a rationale um, uh, for, for, for performing the tasks that we do. And in the UK, although the government there has been undermining career guidance quite a lot, um, career development practitioners are coming together within their professional institute uh, to um, re-professionalise them themselves and to, to build their professional status. And theory is really underpinning uh, that drive to, to professionalise. So that's why I'm starting, uh, I guess, with uh, some theories. 
So um, many of you will be aware of these, and I don't want to labour them too much. Um, but the first theory that I thought would be interesting to remind ourselves of is the social learning theory by Bandura. Um, and some of the important things that come out of this for me are that people's behaviour um, is learned from the environment in which they find themselves. Now, we know that kids watch people around them in their families, in the communities, and they, they watch the way they behave and they absorb that. But unfortunately, kids are surrounded by many influencers. So um, we know about the people that they see, but of course there are other influencers, pop culture, for example, what they're seeing on the media and the internet. These things are strongly influencing kids from a very, uh, very young age. And what uh, Bandura tells us is that when kids see these things happening around them, they're quite likely to replicate these as they get older. Um, he also tells us that kids will replicate the things that they see people doing who are very close to them. And, of course, one of the things this means is that girls, for example, are likely to imitate female role models and boys likewise. Um, and um, the key thing here for me is that people reinforce children's behaviour. So, for example, if a girl imitates a mum or her auntie, that's often reinforced. But if she wants to imitate uh, male role models, that can be negatively reinforced. And this is very important as a child develops a view of the world of work. The second theory I just wanted to touch on was social learning theory for career decision making. This is uh, Krumboldt's work. Um, and basically he builds on what Bandura, uh, or they have built on what Bandura uh, talked about, but really sit that within the idea of career decision making. So the sorts of things that a young person will see around them in their environment, the experiences they have of learning, um, the abilities and talents that they develop, and the skills that they develop will all be um, drawn together uh, and, and applied to their career decision making process. Okay, so these are all very important factors. And finally, um, community interaction theory, which is um, a theory that Bill Law, many of you will know Bill, um, uh, put forward in, in the early 1980s. Um, and again, this kind of draws together the work of Bandura and Krumboldt's. Um, and he, he talks again about how career decisions are enacted within families, within communities, using friends and neighbours, teachers, role models. This is the context in which youngsters are making their career decisions. Um, religious groups, for example, media, they all play a very big part. Um, and Bill reinforces the importance of role models and how youngsters will imitate or mimic the role models that they see around them. And Bill also stresses that there is a very strong um, uh, educational aspect within this so that actually young people can be educated to think differently, to think outside the box um, and so when we're thinking about primary career learning again this is quite an important thing to be thinking about. So I just want to summarise those three theories. Of course, there are many more theories that you could draw upon uh, for this area of work, but these seem to be important to me. Um, so to summarise them then, um, to think that children model um, the world of work on the examples that they see around them. They replicate behaviour, which can be reinforced. Um, and if role models are positive, Kids can follow those, but they're easily drawn into negative role models as well, and I'll give you some <laughs> examples of these in a minute. Okay? But the edge I've made a spelling error that the educational process, not process, uh, can be applied and help children move out of very rigid, uninspiring career um, ideas. Okay. So with those theories in mind, I now want to just briefly explore two pieces of research. These are both pieces of research that I've been directly involved in um, and which have really influenced the way that I've uh, begun to think about career learning in primary school. So um, the first piece of research I wanted to talk about is um, research which is called Gendered Horizons. 
uh, Boys and Girls' Perceptions of Job and Career Choices. This is quite a recent piece of work. It was published in May 2013. Um, the reference and link is on the end of the slide, so you can access that at a later time. Um, there are quite a lot of interesting findings. I don't particularly want to read through every single one of these findings, um, but needless to say, um, they were very interesting. The work was sponsored by a charity in Wales called Chwaratheg, um, and this charity um, is interested in women's place in the world of work, and so they asked us to undertake this research. And uh, it took place in Wales... Um, and uh, we worked with both primary and secondary young people. I'm only going to dwell on primary, but the idea here was to look at what primary kids were thinking about careers in the world of work and then see how that changed as they became older. Um, but certainly um, from the uh, little one's perspective, um, some of the findings that came out of this were that the workplace is very complex. Um, and actually, even into much later age, youngsters don't really understand the workplace. They don't understand work structures. They don't understand how people move uh, from uh, entry levels in certain companies, women's roles, how they move up in, in companies. They really don't understand um, the workplace. It, it is a, a very complex thing for them to, to, uh, to, to, to understand. Um, working with the very small uh, kids uh, from five to seven, we did a lot of focus groups. You'll see a picture in a few minutes, but we did a lot of focus groups uh, with little ones, and we asked them to draw pictures of their job ideas for the future. Um, it was very entertaining. This is one of them that you can see up here. Um, this is a little girl who wanted to be a pop star. Um, and we can see instantly the influence of the pop culture in this young lady's uh, thinking here. Uh, but there were some interesting and very um, uh, insightful, realistic job ideas as well. Um, I'll show you a picture in a second of one of those. But one of the things that was clear from this piece of work was that um, girls, little girls, were being very much drawn to uh, jobs which were around nurturing, um, uh, they were talking about wanting to be nurses, that sort of thing. Whereas boys had got a very different view of the sort of work they wanted to do. So they were often linked to sports or hobbies. Um, and one of the things that was quite distinctive between girls and boys was that um, boys seemed to spend a lot of time with dads doing hobbies. So some of the things that they told us about were things like fishing, cars, bikes sporting activities like football and they were doing a lot of bonding with dads and of course there was a lot of uh, mimicking of those kind of role models going on. Um, what came across very clearly in this research was that media representations can have very positive but also very, very negative um, impacts on kids' thinking. Um, and the, the example that I'll give of this is um, a programme on the television in the UK called The Apprentice. Now, may, maybe some of you have heard of this, but basically young adults compete for a top job um, with a, a captain of industry. And they have to go through a very rigorous selection process where they have to compete in different activities. And it's all very ferocious and very competitive. And at the end of each week, the captain of industry says, you're fired. Okay? And he eliminates one person. Now, this is a very popular program in the UK. Lots of people watch it. Everybody wants to know who's going to be eliminated next. But, of course, for little children watching that, they hear the word apprentice. They hear lots of competition to get the job. They hear you're fired. They see ridicule. They see all sorts of things happening. And when we asked um, in, an, in another piece of uh, research about um, how young people understand vocabulary, um, most of them, when they were asked what apprentice meant, often went you're fired. So they were actually linking that very negative idea of what vocational um, education uh, could be like in the future. So uh, quite alarming. Okay. Um, so carrying on with this research then, um, the kids in this research were really quite aware of some gender inequalities. Um, 
And uh, some of the little girls uh, were given an, an opportunity to talk about um, whether they thought that a girl could do jobs such as crane driver or construction worker. And many of them talked about how that would be difficult, but once one girl started to do that, other girls would follow. So they saw that there was a role for girls in championing alternative career choices, but they were still quite nervous about doing it themselves. So they could see a role, but were a little scared. Okay. Um, um, the final point on this slide, I think, is pretty important as well, which was that children from the affluent backgrounds that worked in this research tended to have their career ideas encouraged more so than children from disadvantaged backgrounds. So um, the second piece of research I wanted to talk to you about is this one called Talking About Career. And this, for me, was the most formative piece of research I think I've ever done. Um, so this research explores the idea of career literacy. Um, and what we did here was um, we identified the top 10 most frequently used words in online career resources. And then we tested youngsters' understanding of the words. And we also tested careers advisors and career teachers' understanding of the words. Um, and um, there were some really quite frightening findings from this. Um, one of the things we discovered was that um, the children all had a definition of the career words and all the teachers had a definition of the career words, um, but the definitions were often very different. So it was quite possible for a careers advisor to have a conversation with a young person using career words and everybody thought each other understood what they were talking about, but they were having parallel conversations. And some of the worrying aspects of this research were that at no point during the education process was anybody teaching career vocabulary or career concepts. So they made assumptions that kids understood what work was, what job was, what the word industry meant, and actually what the word career meant. So nobody was teaching it and nobody was testing it. And so we felt this was very alarming um, and it led us to develop um, some important recommendations, certainly um, that teachers needed to address this. Um, the research also noted that um, for um, science, technology, engineering and maths careers, most kids didn't have any direct experience of those areas of work at all, and therefore their ideas of what those jobs involved, even though they could read it on a screen, were often very limited. So they tended to talk about scientists being in white coats and glasses and um, uh, very, um, what's the word, uh, very academic. Uh, they couldn't uh, understand that there were some really exciting roles there. Um, one of the uh, interesting things that came from this research as well was that kids from a very young age, and we saw that from Gendered Horizons as well, have often started to think about their careers very early on. Um, but in the education system, teachers were not actually addressing that until the age of around 14 in any meaningful way. And so there was a massive lapse in the time when kids were thinking about it and they were actually having it addressed. And during that period of time, some very strange and very inaccurate ideas were starting to develop. Um, and we felt that this was a good reason for starting uh, much, much earlier. Um, one of the things that we um, tried to think about was how you could actually address this idea of career vocabulary and, and career concepts. And um, we figured that actually starting the conversation about what these words mean um, can actually be a really good way of beginning um, to have useful career conversations. Um, there were some words which were very difficult for both teachers and kids to um, actually define and um, the one which really stood out for me was the word industry 
Um, and it is quite a complex word. I bet if I asked um, all of you to write a definition down, there'd probably be about 100 different versions of that word. It is quite hard um, to say exactly what that means, and yet it was a word that is used all the while. Um, and we figure that both teachers and kids needed to, to do some more work on um, that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I've seen, said most of the things on there. there. Okay. Okay, so um, what you've got up there is an idea which um, came about uh, through the research that we did. And this is called the Freya Approach to Concept Mapping. And um, this piece of work was done by some American educators. So it was Jenkins, Bennett, and Rex Road um, who actually developed this idea. And we thought it was quite a good way of starting conversations about career work. So it's a, a basic framework which can be used from very early on to help um, start the process of thinking. So um, the idea here is that they, they actually had developed a complete lesson plan about this, but we, we've kind of tested this out in different ways, and we figure this, this works very well as an idea. So the idea here is that you address an, um, a word or a concept in the middle of this uh, box, and then you ask youngsters to have discussions and do research to um, fill in um, the different fields in this uh, particular uh, form. So they'd have to try and create a definition, so they might have to go online to research that, they might need to discuss it with family, friends, etc., to try and create a definition. Um, but they always also need to characterise that word. They need to give some examples of what that word means and some non-examples. And that learning process is a really helpful way um, of, of developing a much more robust um, conceptual and vocab vocabulary framework to help in later conversations. Um, when you, if you decide to download the research, there's a lot more information about how to apply this model and some more information and background about that uh, in, in vocabulary research. So um, just want to um, summarise then the research um, and to, to think about... Um, what learning we can take from that. So important to note that children are beginning their career ideas very early and that um, because of this it's important that um, primary educators begin to understand uh, the need to um, explore this with their youngsters. Um, and I told you that I was going to tell you about the marine biologist. There was a picture a few minutes ago. Um, but this is a very um, interesting example of how um, uh, things that happen in primary school can have a massive impact on a child's thinking without a teacher actually realising. So when we asked a little boy... Um, what job he wanted to do when he was a grown-up, he drew a picture of a marine biologist. And when I asked him where did that idea come from, what he said to me was, the teacher told us a story about the blue whale, and I really liked the story, and I like animals in the sea. I'd like to find out a bit more about them. So I went home and told my mum, and she was interested, and said, people do that for a job, you know. It's called marine biologist. So he said, that's what I want to do, miss. He said, when I grow up, I'm going to do that job. Now, what that example shows is that this youngster transferred his learning into career thinking, discussed it with a supportive mom, and then started to think about how that could actually translate into reality. So that was a dream that he'd got that he wanted to fulfill in later life. But the sad thing was that the teacher had got no idea whatsoever that that thinking had been taking place. And she was quite astonished when she heard the story and made the pact with herself and me that from now on she was going to try and make career links just in everyday activities um, for the youngsters in her class. So career learning doesn't always have to be formal, sitting down, talking about the future. It can be creative and inventive um, and a really important part of a career, uh, a child's understanding. 
So does it matter that they have fantasy ideas? Well, in our opinion, not at all. It's really important that they have fantasy ideas. It would worry us if they had no ideas. Um, so um, teachers need to draw on that early career thinking and help kids um, be uh, motivated and inspired to take those forward. And they can ultimately become realistic because some people are pop stars, aren't they? Um, so, yes. Um, it's important for primary career um, teaching uh, to reinforce very positively kids' ideas um, and to be mindful not to reinforce uh, negatively. Um, and this is particularly important um, where you're dealing with children from um, underprivileged backgrounds where maybe their aspirations aren't reinforced by their parents. So teachers uh, have got a very important role to play there, um, both as teachers and as role models. So uh, many kids were talking about the teachers that, that motivated them and inspired them. So again, uh, teachers need to be very conscious of that role that they play. Uh, vocabulary is absolutely critical. Vocabulary and conceptual ideas are critical because these are the basic building blocks on which all career development activities will take place. Without the language, you can't research, you can't have conversations. You need those building blocks in place. And there needs to be far more accurate alignment between the age at which kids start thinking about career and the time when people start actually teaching it formally. So it really makes the argument for starting early. Okay, so um, that basically is um, what I wanted to say about the theory and the research and that idea of the Freya model, which I hope some of you will go away and take uh, and test it out and see whether it works for you. I think it could make a great worksheet in primary education, actually. You could make it very attractive. That's a very basic version. Um, but as I say, if you want more information, that's in the vocabulary report talking about Korea. Um, but if you get the these slides, you can take electronic links to both of those pieces of research. And they're both entertaining reads, actually. Very interesting reads. So I do hope that you'll um, make the most of them. So thank you.